And so to close our closing keynote, I guess, we're actually going to close with lunch, which, uh, which counts as, 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 a, as a good keynote experience. Um, John Holdren is somebody that uh, those of us who have worked in the area of energy and environment have known for, I guess, it, the gray hair probably will, will give it away, but uh, I, I didn't have gray hair when, uh, when I first started reading the writings of John, and I don't think he did either. He's been at this for four decades, maybe, maybe even closer to five now. It's been a long time. He, he, he moved into this field very, very early on in his career and has stayed with it as a committed and very thoughtful person for a very long time. I think it was seven years ago, I think it was 2008, when we uh, did a, here at an NCC, our eighth conference or something like that, on, uh, on, on science policy and the environment, John came and gave the Chafee Memorial Lecture. And uh, we printed enough for, uh, uh, for many years, and they, they went very quickly. In fact, we don't have any on our table because they have been, uh, uh, they have sold out. And it, as I mentioned earlier on, about having friends like, uh, like Lenore, people you admire, you respect, moving into important positions. It was wonderful six years ago to see John Holdren move into his current position as director of the Office of Science and Technology Policy and as the uh, science advisor to uh, President Obama. He tells me he is rushing back to the White House after his remarks. We may get one or two questions, but we won't have time for many questions at the end of this. So uh, I'm just going to get off the stage and let John tell us the really important things he has been working on and are coming up from this administration. Thank you very much, Peter, and thank uh, all of you for being here. I realize I'm the only thing remaining between you and lunch. I also realize that this is a 45-minute speech in a 30-minute format, so I will apologize at the outset. There will be detail on the slides beyond what I will talk about. Uh, I will skip over some points rather quickly, but I will post the slides on the OSTP website, www.ostp.gov. Uh, this afternoon, so that anything you miss and you want to look, look into, uh, you can find it there. I just have to figure out where to point this thing to get it to uh, change the slides. There we go. So I'm going to cover a fair amount of terrain. Uh, the key topic uh, for me this afternoon is the link between climate science and the President's Climate Action Plan. Uh, and I hope to give you an update on both, both where the science has been going and where the Climate Action Plan has been going, and finally, the path forward. So let me start with what I call the foundational understandings that underpin the Climate Action Plan. I think these are familiar uh, to everybody in this room. First, the climate of the Earth is changing at a pace and in a pattern that is not consistent with natural influences. We know, in fact, that the dominant influence in these changes is human activities, the human-caused buildup of carbon dioxide and other heat-trapping substances in the atmosphere, uh, mainly from fossil fuel combustion and land use change. We know that these changes are already causing harm in many parts of the world, in many parts of the United States. We know that the harm will continue to grow for decades to come because of the time lags in both the climate system and the energy system. And we know finally, and very importantly, that there's an enormous difference between the additional harm we can expect in the absence of vigorous remedial action versus what we can expect if vigorous remedial action is initiated promptly. So let me turn to a little bit of elaboration on recent observations and analyses from climate science. First, here is the global average air surface temperature uh, from 1880 updated to 2014, the latest information. If you look uh, at the indicated central estimates, 2014 was the warmest year, 2010 the second, 2005 the third. There are uncertainties in these numbers, and so some tabulations will tell you that there's only a 50% chance or a 40% chance that 2014 was really the warmest, but taking the central estimates, it was. And either 
13 or 14 out of the 15 warmest years in the instrumental record, depending on whether you believe NOAA's assessment of the data or NASA's, either 13 or 14 out of the 15 warmest occurred since 2000. There has been a lot of talk about a so-called hiatus in uh, global warming since 1998. This, with the data through 2014, shows a single linear fit for the whole period, 1970 to 2014, or a piecewise linear fit breaking at 1998. And you see they do not differ much. Basically, uh, the world has been warming at roughly 0.15 degrees centigrade per decade uh, for a long time. We also know that more than 90% of the excess heat trapped by greenhouse gases goes into the ocean. That means a very small change in what goes into the ocean in a given year can influence the rate of increase in global air temperature for that year. And we know that the warming of the ocean has continued apace. Uh, we also know that human activities are the primary driver of what we have been observing. You can see this in a number of ways. One, if you look at the 10,000-year record of atmospheric concentrations of carbon dioxide on the top and methane on the bottom, you see this extraordinary spike that started about 250 years ago, completely uh, out of sync with the natural variations over a very long period of time. And we know, in fact, in the case of the CO2 spike, that fossil fuels were largely responsible for that because we can use the concentration of radioactive carbon-14 in the atmospheric CO2 to determine how much came from fossil fuels. Carbon-14 only has a half-life of about 6,000 years when it's sequestered away from the atmosphere in the materials, the biogenic materials that ultimately form fossil fuels, it's all decayed away by the time that fossil fuel is exploited and burned. So there's zero carbon-14 in fossil fuel, and you can see the dilution effect readily in the atmosphere. The uh, buildup, that spike one sees in the concentrations of the heat-trapping gases, it coincides perfectly with the spike in atmospheric temperatures. This is uh, more than 11,000 years of uh, atmospheric temperatures reconstructed. And you can see that, in fact, a long-term natural cooling trend has been reversed, and reversed very suddenly by uh, a temperature spike that coincides with the buildup of those human-caused uh, atmospheric heat-trapping gases. Uh, global average sea level has been behaving uh, accordingly. This is the record uh, both from tide gauges and satellite measurements uh, since 1880. Uh, but in addition to uh, the warming effect and the rise of sea level, we are affecting the oceans in another very important way, and that is reducing the pH of the ocean, increasing the hydrogen concentration, which is a result of the fact that dissolved carbon dioxide in the surface layer of the ocean forms carbonic acid by the very simple chemical relation shown there. That lowers the pH. And although the pH reduction looks small, you need to remember it's a logarithmic scale, we have increased the, the ocean surface concentration of hydrogen ion about 30-fold since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, and we are headed under business as usual for a much larger increase. Why that matters? Ocean acidification matters because increasing hydrogen ion concentration imperils marine organisms that make their skeletons or their shells out of calcium carbonate, and that includes coral, shrimp, clams, oysters, and the pteropods uh, shown here, which are the basis of much of the food chain in the southern uh, oceans and many other parts of the ocean, and you can see the difference between less acidified and more acidified water between the left and the right. Ooh, come on. There we go. I uh, want to talk for a moment about the impacts of climate change on weather extremes. Uh, as this quote from the journal Nature Climate Change uh, notes, it was 1988 when Jim Hansen famously said in a congressional hearing, it's time to stop waffling and say that the evidence is pretty strong that the greenhouse effect is here. It is now more than pretty strong that the climate change that is being produced by the greenhouse gas buildup in the atmosphere is driving a variety of extremes in weather, which in a way are the leading edge of the most discernible consequences of global climate change. And this is, uh, for those uh, mathematically inclined, a particularly telling uh, demonstration of what's going on. 
These are the probability distributions decade by decade for summer temperature anomalies on land in the northern hemisphere. The baseline normal distribution, which is a black curve barely visible under the subsequent decades, the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s in the center. That's the normal baseline distribution. Uh, the horizontal axis is standard deviations in that summer temperature uh, in land areas of the northern hemisphere. And what you see as those uh, distributions move to the right, when you get to the 2000s, 2001 to 2011, you see astonishingly that the portion of the northern hemisphere land area that is experiencing more than three standard deviations warmer than the previous normal has increased from around one-tenth to two-tenths of a percent of the land area to about 10 percent of the land area just in this short space of time. This is an enormous increase. We're talking about changing one in a thousand year heat waves to uh, one in 10 approximately. We're seeing changes in very heavy precipitation. The amount of precipitation that occurs in the most extreme downpours is going up, for example, all around the United States and around much of the rest of the world. These numbers are from the 2014 third U.S. national climate assessment. And it's happening in many regions, not just in the United States. This is a picture from Munich Rees uh, 2014 analysis of world weather uh, talking about the flooding coming from heavy rainfall episodes in many parts of the world. And yet, paradoxically to some, there are drought-prone regions in the world that are getting drier in a world that overall is getting wetter. And that's as a result of the factors listed here. When more of the rain falls in extreme events, more of it runs off rather than soaking into the soil. Higher temperatures mean bigger losses to evaporation from surface water and soil. Mountains get more rain and less snow, which means more runoff in winter and less runoff remaining in summer. Earlier summer snow melt in a warming world also leaves less runoff for the summer. And altered atmospheric circulation patterns in some instances are also playing a role in this circumstance where we're seeing a number of drought prone regions getting uh, even drier. This is the most recent U.S. drought monitor, January 20, 2015. Uh, not uh, as extreme drought as we were experiencing a couple years ago, but still particularly in the American West and California, above all, uh, really extreme uh, drought conditions. Uh, wildfires have been increasing apace. These are total wildland acres burned in the United States in millions of acres on the top, federal firefighting costs on the bottom from 1985 up through 2012. The most powerful storms are getting more so. As noted in this rather busy slide, tropical cyclones get their energy from the warm surface layer of the ocean. It's getting both warmer and deeper, both of which affect the strength of cyclones. And they also get their energy from water vapor in the atmosphere, which is also going up under global warming. Typhoon Haiyan, probably the most powerful typhoon to make landfall in modern times. Uh, traversed an area where what is called the tropical cyclone heat potential had gone up more than 20 percent just since 1990. Uh, that uh, typhoon, with the help of a storm surge augmented by sea level rise, killed 6,000 people, injured 27,000, destroyed 1.2 million homes. This is a cartoon I like um, from Tolls in the Washington Post off the point that you still cannot in general prove that a specific extreme weather event was caused by climate change. There's very powerful evidence that these events are being strengthened by climate change, but Tolls has this wonderful cartoon uh, about uh, the absence of absolute proof that a given storm uh, was caused by climate change. Let me talk about future change and the leverage for timely action. There we go. Oops, went too far now. So temperature and impacts grow for decades under all scenarios. Uh, this shows the range of the IPCC's most recent scenarios published in fall of 2014 in the report of Working Group 1. 
the lowest scenario RCP reference concentration pathway 2.6 corresponds uh, pretty much to what you would want if you're trying to meet the target that much of the world has accepted of keeping the temperature increase since pre-industrial times to about 2 degrees C. Uh, all of the other scenarios uh, up to the business as usual red one uh, obviously crash through that 2 degree C level uh, before uh, 2050 even. And what is particularly worrisome for those who think about long time scales is that the last time the average air surface temperature of the Earth was 2 degrees C was 130,000 years before the present and at that time sea level was 4 to 6 meters higher than it is today. The last time it was 3 degrees C above the 1900 level was about 30 million years ago and sea level then was 20 to 30 meters higher than today. Nobody is saying the sea level could possibly get to those levels in this century, but sea level rise in response to these kinds of changes in the Earth's heat balance is a steady and sometimes rapidly accelerating process when ice sheets actually slump into the ocean. The dynamics of that are not well understood, but we are flirting with very large sea level rise uh, in the long term. The difference, though, between low and high emission scenarios is enormous. This is the difference for the United States in average surface air temperature um, increase between the last few decades of the 1900s and the last few decades of the 2000s. The uh, temperature change expected in a low emission scenario very much corresponding to the IPCC 2.6 that I showed on the previous slide versus the high emission scenario corresponding to the RCP 8.5, very approximately. Enormous difference in what we have to cope with in average surface temperatures in the United States and indeed in the rest of the world. Uh, as already noted, sea level will rise for centuries, but how fast and to what ultimate level depend very much on what kinds of action we take. These are the NOAA uh, estimates going up to uh, as much as two additional meters in this century, but again, you can see what the slope is uh, on the high end of these uh, sea level increases. Same applies to ocean acidity. What we do in terms of limiting emissions matters enormously to the future acidity of the ocean. You look at the difference uh, in these curves out to 2100. So I want to turn to the President's Climate Action Plan, which he rolled out at a speech at Georgetown University, shown there uh, on June 25th, 2013. Uh, three major pillars, cutting carbon pollution in America, preparing the United States for the impacts of climate change. Where's the third one? Come on, folks. And leading international efforts to address climate change. The science basis uh, is uh, summarized as follows. Understanding the science that I have just been very quickly summarizing here provides the motivation for seeking to develop a cost-effective plan to reduce the impacts we've been talking about. It provides the sense of urgency for doing so now rather than waiting. It provides the awareness that any reasonable plan must include both mitigation and adaptation because no matter what we do, we can't stop climate change in its tracks. It provides the detailed knowledge of the sources of the offending emissions and the character of our vulnerabilities. In the interest of time, I didn't show the sources here, but that information is widely available. And it provides the recognition that any U.S. plan has to include a component designed to bring other countries along. In addition, understanding the technological possibilities for both mitigation and preparedness and resilience, and I think others have talked about those here at some length, reveals that there is really a wide range of options, both for cutting the pollution that's driving climate change and for better preparing society to deal with the changes that we don't avoid. That understanding of technological possibilities has enabled the Climate Action Plan to focus specifically on promoting progress on the development and implementation of the most promising options. And understanding the results of economic assessments of the cost of taking such actions versus the cost of inaction provides the confidence that moving ahead now is in fact the right thing to do and has provided the basis for the Climate Action Plan's focus on the options that are most cost effective and that bring significant co-benefits like reducing conventional air pollution and its direct 
health impacts. So let me talk very quickly about progress uh, on the President's Climate Action Plan, starting with the cutting carbon pollution in America element. Uh, reducing carbon pollution from power plants is a big part of that. I think you all know the EPA has proposed standards both for uh, new fossil fuel power plants and for existing ones. Reducing other greenhouse gases, we rolled out a strategy last March for reducing methane emissions. Uh, EPA put out a proposal in July on reducing hydrofluorocarbons, and we just announced this month a 2025 target to reduce methane emissions from the uh, oil and gas sector by 40 to 45 percent from 2012 levels uh, by a variety of means, including EPA regulation. Directing agencies to support climate preparedness and resilience. All agencies are now required by executive order to develop and implement plans for integrating climate change preparedness and resilience into everything they do. Uh, two task forces established, one internal and one external, on preparedness and resilience. The Interagency Council on Climate Change Preparedness and Resilience, co-chaired by OSTP, CEQ, the National Security Council, and OMB, and the State, Local, and Tribal Leaders Task Force on Climate Change Preparedness and Resilience, where 26 elected officials, governors, mayors, tribal leaders from around the country delivered a comprehensive set of recommendations to the to the president in uh, November of last year. Uh, managing flood, drought, and wildfire risks. Again, a set of partnerships, initiatives, studies, uh, a new uh, competition uh, on disaster resilience uh, with a billion dollars in, uh, in funding, uh, very active domain. Uh, mobilizing science and data for climate resilience. People need information that is locally specific, that is actionable, that is in forms they can understand. We have uh, in that direction a climate data initiative launched in March of last year. Of course, we released the uh, national climate assessment, which was designed to be usable at the local and regional level in May. The U.S. Climate Resilience Toolkit uh, was launched in November, and the Climate Education and Literacy Initiative, about which I'll say a little more in a moment, uh, just last month. Uh, enhancing international efforts, bilateral engagement. I think you all know about the U.S.-China joint announcement that took place uh, in November. Uh, this was unprecedented. It was finally an instance of the two largest emitters in the world stepping up and saying, we are responsible, we are going to take action, and we are going to work together to try to lead the world industrialized and developing in the direction of a comprehensive approach to climate change. There was also a lot of specifics in that joint announcement about ways we will collaborate continually on carbon capture and storage, uh, new clean energy research, uh, and more. Similarly with India, the President has just returned from India uh, very early yesterday morning uh, after uh, reaching agreement with Prime Minister Modi on a number of uh, enhancements and additions to U.S.-India cooperation on clean energy and climate change, including uh, releasing, as he promised uh, at the U.N. Climate Change Summit last September, releasing higher resolution elevation data, 30 meter resolution versus 90 meters for India, extremely important for people planning uh, to cope with uh, climate change impacts and a variety of other uh, hazards. Again, down at the bottom there is some detail about the additional elements of the agreements reached in India just a few days ago. We are also working to enhance multilateral engagement, uh, the G20, uh, engagement, of course, with the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change process, aiming toward a new global agreement in Paris, which the French ambassador has just discussed at length. Uh, mobilizing clean energy and preparedness finance, $3 billion pledge to the Green Climate Fund uh, at the G20 in November. Uh, working with the UK and Germany on a global innovation lab for climate finance, a public-private platform to advance the next generation of finance instruments. Finally, a few words about the path forward. What are we doing uh, moving ahead? A few focuses for the next year. We will need to defend the requests in the President's FY16 budget, which will be rolled out on Monday, uh, the request for clean energy research development demonstration and accelerated deployment. That's what 
RD cube means, and for Earth observation, which is always under attack by some in the Congress who say we don't understand climate change, but we also don't want to know any more about it. Um, <laughs> We will be working to complete the first phase of the Quadrennial Energy Review, the QER, which is focused on reliable, low-emission, renewable-friendly, climate-resilient infrastructure for energy transmission, storage, and distribution. We will be launching its implementation. We expect that to be out by the end of February. Of course, we are looking uh, this year to get finalization of the EPA's power plant rules for both new and existing plants. We are uh, working to increase preparedness by improving the coverage, the usability, and the user base of both the Climate Data Initiative and the Climate Resilience Toolkit, working very closely with the Chief Technology Officer and their IT experts to get that done. We are aiming to increase bilateral engagement internationally on clean energy and climate change with major developing country economies beyond India and China to include Brazil, Indonesia, Mexico, South Africa. We want to build the public-private partnership for boosting resilience in developing countries that President Obama announced at that uh, splendid uh, September 14 uh, UN climate summit that the Secretary General uh, Ban Ki-moon uh, pulled off with such uh, ambition and aplomb. Uh, we want to continue the all-fronts push toward a comprehensive, equitable, forward-leaning, and binding climate agreement in Paris in December. We want to implement the President's Climate Education and Literacy Initiative to ensure continuing public support for all of the above. And indeed, we will need you, all of you, for all of the above. So thank you very much for what you have been doing and for what you will do.